We have to go to the root. We have to go to the cause. Dealing with the condition itself is not enough. Dear Mr. Massa, I'm just trying to mind my own business. What's the matter? It's just another day, another black king captured. I'm about to lose my brain stuck inside this ghetto rapture. I got a lot of smoke. If you want it, you can have it. They want a hat trick, but this is black girl magic. Ain't talking about the kind that'll make you disappear, but I'm talking about the power of the melanin within. Ain't looking for trouble, but I'ma say this one time. I put two dupes up if you try to touch mine. We still want justice for Samir and Trayvon. You say you don't see color, but racism ain't blind. They targeting little kids whose skin look just like mine. So I'm paranoid, it's a war zone outside. And I'm a black queen, so if you ask me to step out of my car, you gon' have to snatch me. Cause I ain't going no damn well. Had to spend my whole life living unfair. Ancestors got my back and they right here. You can never understand, it's a nightmare. Living in my black shoes by the black rules. You can keep your handshake, I don't dap coon. The white man would go nuts if he cash you. But you all on his side like a damn fool. Make it make sense. We are oppressed. Queen. We are exploited. Downtrodden. Make it make sense. We are denied not only civil rights but even human rights. Alma Dyer. Well, the only way we're going to get some of this Alma Dyer. oppression and exploitation Queen. away from us or aside from us is come together Queen. against the common enemy. Who taught you to hate the Alma text Dyer. of your Parents, pay attention to the books, the school system, even to your little children. Lies mixed with wisdom. His skin too bright, so he was blind to the prison. My skin just right, so I collide with the vision. You trying to pray to God, but we tied the religion. No savior saving, we got to save our savings. We used to pay miss, how we gon' make the slave rich? But who's to blame and tell me why you complaining? We need a team effort just to rule the nation. Like a bad relationship, missing communication. We missing moderation. They trying to get a poison to my population. No reparations. I'm getting tired of Satan. We are oppressed. Queen. I'm getting tired of waiting. We are downtrodden. Queen. We are denied not only civil rights, but even human rights. Alma Dyer. Well, the only way we're going to get some of this. Alma Dyer. Oppression and exploitation. Queen. Away from us or aside from us is come Why they hate 
hating on me. Is it cause I'm free and I got Malcolm X in my jeans and I got... All right. Hello, everyone. Grand Rising. Thanks for tuning back in once again to the original Queen Amadai Shakur show. I'm your host, Queen Amadai Shakur, and this is your first morning wake up call. So as you're coming in, please feel free to go ahead and subscribe to the channel. If you haven't done so already, be sure to click that notification bell and click the word all so you're notified each time the Queen Goddess goes live. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me clear my throat and sip some tea real quick. I think the queen's about to lose her voice. Pay attention. Okay, so with that all being said, everyone, please get the likes up. Please like and share. You know how they do the queen on YouTube, honey, out here in these streets. Please get the likes up. Also, don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Dr. Underscore A Shakur, TikTok at Dr. A Shakur, and Twitter at DGoddess27. And as per usual, if you don't like what the queen is cooking, please exit stage left. Okay, don't leave me ridiculous comments complaining about what I said on the or, you know, during the commentary, because if you didn't like it, you didn't have to listen. And I say that only because someone left me a foolish comment days ago. All right. And so anyway, hello, Nita's and Mike's world, Martel, Pennywise, Miss Elevation, Nessa G, Darnell, all right, Aboriginal woman, Claudette, Juju B in the house, Perplex is here, Christy One Love, that crazy beach Aries. <laughs> Juju said, low down, dirty scandals know what to do. Exactly. Antoinette, Battle Axe, Miss J. Deronda is here. Okay. Pearly is here. All right. So let's get into it, Rashid. A shout out to my moderators. Y'all know they be putting in work. All these lives I be doing. Okay. That's why I love them. And I love y'all too, Royals. Okay. So let's get ready to get into it. Jane, J.R. Meadows in the house. Above all the drama. Okay, above all that drama, Stacey Quentin is here, Nessie, Nessie uh, X, Nessa G. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. I see you, Dora. Everyone be sure to get those likes up. Now, we are going live on the spiritual channel today. For those of you who follow, we're going live on the spiritual channel at about uh, 1.30. Okay, 1.30. I'm going a little bit earlier today. I've been going at 3 o'clock for the last two days, but today, 1.30 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. And also there's a video coming up right after this at 1015 on the backup channel. We have to talk about uh, the person who testified at Young Thug and YSL's trial, who clearly said that he was high as a kite. And uh, we have to talk about the twin that lost her life after she rejected someone. And then also the toddler that was hit by an Uber. And also this nefarious man who took out his three sons and now they may not be able to use his testimony. All right. Well, they absolutely won't be able to use it. Uh, his his confession. OK, so with that all being said, let's get into the nefariousness of it all, because when I tell you. This is, I promise you, the most nefarious news since Diddy, since the whole Diddy debacle began. This is the most nefarious news after. OK, so let's talk about it. Likes up, everyone, please like and share. So I watched this docuseries. Um, I watched a couple of episodes of this docuseries quiet on set about the nefarious shenanigans that was going on and probably still going on, who knows, at Nickelodeon, all right, with some of the uh, cast members and some of the crew. Uh, so we're going to get into it. Now, first, I'm going to start off by showing you, uh, hey, Latasha, I'm going to start off by showing you my um, TikTok that I did, okay, the TikTok that I did about it on yesterday. All right. So with that, I've been saying, hey, Desmond, let's get into it. Lights up, everyone. Please like and share. I'm going to share my screen. I watched the docuseries Quiet on the Set about Nickelodeon and all the nefarious things that went on there with cast members and staff. And, you know, I wasn't really surprised, but uh, this goes to show why so many people who are child stars have all these problems with substance and alcohol abuse when they become adults and as well as mental health issues. Uh, so let's get into it. Brian Peck was a dialogue coach for Nickelodeon and also an actor. He worked on shows like Keenan and Cal, The Amanda Show with Amanda Bynes, Boy Meets World, What I Like About You. And he also appeared as the character Pickle Boy on the show All That. But he had dark secrets uh, that eventually came to surface. And uh, it wasn't good. He was actually accused and convicted of essaying Drake Bell. Okay, and at the time all this happened, no one knew that it was one of their own cast members who had accused him. 
please pay attention. Brian Peck faced almost a dozen charges. In 2004, he was sentenced to 16 months after having been found guilty of lewd acts with a minor. Now, what was interesting to me is that when Nickelodeon brought forth the information that he'd been accused, uh, they had a meeting with the parents and the and the cast members, but then they asked the parents to leave the room, which I thought was a bit odd. And then after all of this, they basically swept it under the rug and no one really spoke about it. At the time of the allegations, Drake Bell's name wasn't publicized due to his age. He sat down to speak about it during the docuseries and gave accounts of what actually happened. And it was really uh, disturbing, okay? But not only that, this wasn't the only time something like this happened. There was another person who worked there by the name of Jason Handy. And uh, he was arrested uh, for similar charges. Jason Handy was a production assistant who was always dealing with the kids. And basically the kids trusted him and really liked him, thought he was a cool person. But in April of 2003, cops were tipped off. And that's when they went to serve an arrest warrant and found in his possession 10,000 images that were clearly inappropriate of people that were not adults. Okay, please pay attention. After Jason Handy was arrested, some of the parents didn't even want to get involved in the investigation. They wanted nothing to do with it. There were like two parents who came forward. And one of them basically felt like, you know, her daughter was going to be blamed for it because she was choosing to speak out. After Handy was arrested, there was another crew member arrested just four months later. Please pay attention. After Brian Peck was released, uh, he went on to work for Disney. I mean, go figure. You'd think that they would have had more concern for the safety of the cast members than hiring someone who's already been convicted of doing such things. Now, they claim basically that, you know, they didn't know all of the information about the charges and that when he was asked about it, uh, that he basically said that it had been taken care of. Well, of course it was. Uh, he served time for it. So clearly that was taken care of. But they didn't do their due diligence and investigate to see exactly what happened, what all he was accused of. Well, maybe they just didn't care. You know, I have heard some things about Disney and also I've done some research on them years ago and uh, very similar circumstances, which is why when this all came out, I wasn't surprised. Please pay attention. After the docuseries premiered, former producer of Nickelodeon, Dan Schneider, came out and issued an apology. It was very difficult me facing my past behaviors, um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret. And I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. I don't think that he's sorry about anything other than the fact that he was depicted as who he truly is in the docuseries, that people spoke the truth about him. And many of the things that he did on set uh, and with employees and cast members was inappropriate, quite frankly, and in more ways than one. Some of the things were steeped in racism. Some of the things were, you know, uh, based on gender inequality and all of those things. And yeah, I don't think that he's sorry. I think that actually what he did in his behavior was opened up the door for other things to happen and to fester. Please pay attention. Okay, so like I said, clearly nefarious. Clearly nefarious. And let me just tell you all something. The guy, John Handy, uh, who worked there and uh, was, in fact, a production assistant who worked with these children on a regular basis, and they trusted him. Some of them spoke, you know, they're now adults, of course, but some of them spoke about their interactions with him. Uh, he seemed like a nice person that they could trust. Little did they know what he was up to. And here's the thing. I find it very interesting because, you see, John Handy, unlike R. Kelly, didn't get a lengthy sentence. Okay, please pay attention. Handy pleaded no contest to one felony and was sentenced to five to seven years in prison, suspended for a 30-day jail sentence and three years of unsupervised probation. Do you all hear that? He received credit for 170 days incarceration and was ordered to undergo substance abuse treatment. Now, I want you all to just pay attention. Let that sink in for a moment. Let that sizzling your spirit. Because this is a whole lot different than how they treated R. Kelly. Now, this man was dealing with people's children. They found over 10,000 images, okay, of kitty, you know what, the rhymes with corn. All right. And let me just add this tidbit of information because it was so much going on. I had to write some of this stuff down, honey, so I wouldn't forget any of the details. Uh, salacious though they were. Now, so with that all being said, he had all of this stuff going on. And uh, he also had some of the some keepsakes, basically, 
Uh, the police say when they contacted uh, one of the parents, her daughter's name was Brandy. I don't recall them giving her last name, but she worked for Nickelodeon as well. And uh, this guy, John Handy, had been emailing the daughter. Now, the mother says she didn't think there was anything wrong with it at first. She thought it was all innocent because he was emailing her about possibly getting her on other shows and things like that. But here's the thing. I would have absolutely thought that was a red flag because to me, that's part of the grooming process. You start off being all nice and then having uh, private conversations with the child. At the end of the day, anything pertaining to work or anything else should have been gone through should have gone through the mother. He should not have been emailing a kid, okay? Please make it all make sense. And so the mother to me was just careless herself. And now, so basically what they said was, uh, not only did they find those 10,000 images, uh, but they say that he had kissed a nine-year-old child, okay? He was trying to do more, but the child obviously felt uncomfortable, okay? And then out of those... Uh, I don't know where I put that receipt. Out of those um, 10,000 pictures, there was like 1,700 of them. 1,738, I do believe, were of girls, okay? And then um, some of them were in very wicked uh, positions, okay? And things like that, okay? Some of it was like even included uh, the same thing that Balenciaga was accused of in those pictures they released, you know, with the kids looking like they were tied up and in bondage and stuff like that. There was things like that. And also the woman who was the mother of uh, the, the young girl named Brandy says that when they reached out to her, the police, that is, they informed her that they found all these Ziploc bags and each of the bags had a little girl's name in it with an item. And in one bag, there was a little girl's underwear. Okay. And uh, her daughter's name was there and there was letters or something from her daughter in there. So this is all just sick, but he gets this minuscule sentence. I just want you all to pay attention. And one of the one of the victims was seven years old. One of the victims was seven years old. So I find it all very interesting. At the end of the day, this is what he was doing. And, uh, you know, got little consequences as far as I'm concerned. He should have gotten a life sentence for all of this, all of this stuff. And who knows how long he was doing it. And here's the thing. I've told you all a myriad of times before that when people are predators, okay, when people want to do nefarious things, specifically uh, with minors, they'll put themselves in an, an, um, an occupation or career where they have access to them. Like there'll be, you know, uh, little league coaches, okay? They'll work with Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. There'll be camp counselors and things of that nature, open daycare facilities, you know, become teachers. Not saying that all of these people do these things, but I'm saying people that are serious predators, this is what they like to do, okay? This is what they absolutely do to be around children. And uh, at the end of the day, one of the people that was mostly to blame who likely didn't say anything and, in my opinion, created the atmosphere for these things was Dan Schneider. Now, Dan Schneider, was he's, a to me, a pathological liar anyway. Okay, so he obviously came from wealthy parents who graduated from Harvard. And then he lied and said he went to Harvard, which he never did. Okay, and then he played on Saved by the Bell. And he actually wrote some of the uh, stuff for Saved by the Bell, which is how he ended up getting the job at Nickelodeon, writing for the show All That. Now, he did a bunch of inappropriate things, too, uh, specifically with Amanda Bynes. And let's not forget, I just spoke about Amanda Bynes days ago when I was talking about the things that she was alleging, okay, about John Travolta. And, you know, now she has all of these issues, as we can see, and so do many of these adults who were at one time children, actors, and actresses, okay? So it's all real crazy, but hold on, because we're going to get into it. I'm going to show you some pictures uh, in a moment of some of the uh, some of the stuff they showed up there that I thought was just inappropriate. Like stuff, everyone, please like and share. And also, let's not forget that Disney actually hired Brian Peck after he had spent 16 months, you know, was, was sentenced to 16 months for what he did. And, you know, that's no shock because those of you who've been following me from day one since 2020, you know that I did a whole expose on Disney. OK, that was all in the fairies. And the reason I did it was because Abigail Disney, who's the heir, the heiress to, uh, to Disney, basically came out talking greasy about Kobe Bryant after he passed away. 
And I said, well, hold on, wait a minute now. I know she's not talking with the things that they said about her father and her uncle, okay, at Disney. So that's why that's what prompted me to do even do an expose on that because the nerve of her. Like, girl, your whole family has dirt on their names, okay? And not to mention your corporation. Okay, so let me see where I want to start. Okay, here, here's where I start at, right here with John, Jason Handy. I'm sorry, I was calling him John Handy. His name is Jason Handy. Okay, so where is convicted offender, uh, SEX offender Jason Handy from Quiet on the Set? Now, the new investigation discovery documentary uh, series Quiet on Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids, of kids tv explores the disturbing allegations against nickelodeon production assistant jason handy who was responsible for handling child actors on set now in episode two hidden in plain sight a mother of a child actor named brandy who appeared in an episode describes handy's inappropriate relationship with her daughter now that's what i was just telling you about and so um goes on to say and here's the thing that's crazy about the mother i want you all to listen to this she says after she was told about this stuff, and here's here's the thing too, I almost forgot this part. So this man, when he was emailing her young daughter, he actually sent her a picture of himself in his birthday suit playing with his toy. And y'all know what I'm talking about. Now, he sent this to this child and the mother, she says, after a few months, Handy emailed Brandy uh, what I just told you. And she says, I went back and forth. Should I call the police? They're going to think I'm a bad parent because I allowed her to talk to this person. I struggled with this. I finally told myself I can't call the police. All I can do is make sure I keep him far away from her. What is she talking about? So let's get this straight. So this woman was more concerned about keeping up her own appearance, about not being held accountable or partially responsible or to blame for what this person did to her daughter. And then in the process, didn't see to it that he got any criminal consequences, didn't see to it that he was taken away from other children that he possibly could have done things to. This is all real crazy. She didn't go to the police after he said something so disgusting via email to her daughter, Brandy. Yeah, I find that all interesting. Another thing is, you know, I absolutely think that some of these parents were complicit, that they may have known what was going on. They may not have known every little detail, but they should have known. I do believe I think some of them knew inappropriate things were going on because here's here's why. When Jason Handy was arrested, they basically, the parents that is, they didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to participate in the investigation. So they didn't want to testify. They didn't want to bring their children to speak with the police. Why would you not want your child to speak? Well, I believe it's because they felt it was more important for them uh, to keep their, their kids working with Nickelodeon. That's what I think. And this happens in a lot of cases. These parents will sell out their kids for money and fame. That's what it had to have been. Why else would you not cooperate with the investigation when you know that this is a man who worked with your child every day on set? All crazy. So anyway, Jason Handy was arrested in 2003 after an investigation revealed his inappropriate interactions with children in his church, in his neighborhood, and all over the internet. Now I want you all to pay attention because he did all of this and still got a minuscule sentence. Nowhere near what R. Kelly got, like I said. And here it is right here, the information I was looking for. So the 10,000 images of children, including 1,768 images of young girls in erotic poses, 238 images of girls doing explicit things, and two images of girls in uh, bondage activity, as well as seven video files of minors doing things that grown people should be doing, okay? Police also found journals, and this is the thing. Police found journals that he had written for himself. And in one of them, it said, I'm a full-blown pedophile." okay? It said he was full-blown and also said that he was, you know, looking uh, for someone to grape. This is what he said in his journal. The investigation led to Handy receiving a six-year prison sentence. He was When he was released in 2009, he registered as an SEX offender in North Carolina. Handy was arrested again in 2014 and charged with three counts of indecent liberties with a child and two counts of SEX offender registry violations. 
As of now, Handy is serving a sentence in the Federal Correction Institution, uh, Petersburg Medium, Medium in Virginia. He is set to be released. Or his release date is set for August 28th of 2038. So he got, he's a repeat offender. So he did this again. Then they gave him a lengthier sentence. You see, here's the thing. If they'd given him a lengthier sentence in the first place, he wouldn't have been free to go out and do this again to even more children, to victimize more children. And for those of you who haven't seen this docuseries, you can watch it on ID and Max. Now, with that all being said, let's talk about Dan Schneider. Dan Schneider is the ex-producer, and he came out and apologized, like I told you guys. And uh, really, to me, you know, he, like I said in the video, he was just, as far as I'm concerned, trying to basically uh, save face. I don't think he's sorry for anything he did. He knew exactly what he was doing. And... It wasn't just about him doing inappropriate things on set with people's children. It was also about him being racist and having some very um, lewd things done on film that were not appropriate for children. Okay. Uh, so with that all been said, now Drake Bell was the one who um, blew the whistle on Drake Bell blew the whistle on, uh, what's the guy's name? Brian Peck, okay? And at the time, no one even knew that it was a cast, a cast member who had exposed him, uh, which led to his arrest in 2003. And so he came out and spoke. I'm going to show a clip from that. Uh, I'm just going to play the audio. I'm not going to show the video. Like, up, everyone. Please like and share. I was sleeping on the couch where I would usually sleep. And... And uh, I woke up to him um, I, I just opened my eyes, I woke up, and he was uh assaulting me and I froze and was in complete shock and had no idea what to do or how to react and I have no idea how to get out of the situation. I couldn't run outside, have my fire. I, I mean, I was just, you know, what am I, call my mom and be like, hey, this just happened. Can you come pick me up? I'll just sit here and wait. I had no car. I didn't drive. I was 15 at this time. <sighs> I don't know, uh, I really don't know how to, uh, um, elaborate on that on, on camera, really. Whatever you feel comfortable or you think will help. Why don't you do this? Yeah. Why don't you think of the worst stuff that someone can do to somebody as a sexual assault? And that'll answer your question. Okay, he didn't even want to speak on it. Okay, that's how bad it was. And you know, I saw comments on the internet when people were saying, uh, some people, some men were saying that he was 15 years old, he could have fought back, he could have done this, he could have done that. Well, here's the thing. Um, yeah, he was 15 years old, but you don't know what kind of teenager he was. Some teenagers are quiet and withdrawn. Some of them can't fight. They don't know how. They've never been in a fight. And that's likely what's the case because he was a child actor. Okay, it had been so for a while but before this happened to him. So with that all being said, I don't think that people should victim blame and uh, basically act like he just let it happen because he was taken advantage of, okay? He was still a child, though he was a teenager. And this is a person whom he trusted. And just imagine waking up out of your sleep to someone doing something like that to you. I mean, who knows what he was thinking? Okay, who knows what he was thinking? But at least he was brave enough to speak out and tell so the man got consequences, okay? So just all very crazy. And then Dan Schneider, the ex-producer, defended his relationship with Amanda Bynes. You know, because he was basically responsible for her uh, celebrity status, for her fame, okay? He's the one who 
catapulted her to stardom, so to speak. Dan Schneider defends his relationship with Amanda Bynes after she ran away from home. The embattled Nickelodeon writer and producer adds that he supported her desire to be emancipated from her parents. So I'm sure he did. Okay. A former Nickelodeon writer and producer, Dan Schneider, defended his controversial relationship with the Amanda Show star, Amanda Bynes, in an interview on Tuesday, saying he fully supported her decision to pursue emancipation from her parents and assisted her in her attempt to run away from home. He says she wanted that for herself. Okay. Um, he said she wanted that for herself. And he said, we supported her. Schneider is credited for creating some of Nickelodeon's most successful shows like All That and I, Carlin, as well as launching the careers of several children actors, including Kenan Thompson, Drake Bell, Ariana Grande, uh, during his time as a showrunner in the 1990s and 2000s. One of his biggest stars was Amanda Bynes, who went from Laugh Factory child prodigy uh, to one of the youngest female talents uh, to have her own self-titled show. Now, during Tuesday's interview posted on his YouTube page, Dan Warp, Schneider opened up about the controversy that surrounded his relationship with Vines, as in part detailed in the docuseries, beginning with her desire to become emancipated. He says Amanda was between the ages of 16 and 17, and she wanted to be emancipated from her parents, which was a, was, which was a fairly common thing uh, with successful young actors at the time. She wanted that for herself, so she turned to her team, which included her attorney, her agent, her manager, her publicist, me, uh, because she included me as part of her team, uh, thought of me that way. We supported her. She tried to get emancipated, and it ended up not working out, and she didn't. Quiet on the set recounts a number of questionable moments Schneider had with Vines, including footage of the two performing a scene in a hot tub and instances where Schneider would work with Vines uh, into the night rather than letting her go letting her do her schoolwork along with other children on the set. Yeah, that's another thing they talked about in the docuseries. You see, all of the kids went to school on set. And so sometimes Amanda would be absent from getting her lessons because she would be with him, which I thought was inappropriate. Why is she staying with him rather than getting her work done? But here is a picture of one of the scenes that I thought was inappropriate, where he's fully clothed, of course, but he's nonetheless in a hot tub with Amanda. Like stuff, everyone, please like and share. Thank you in advance. And some of these pictures I actually screenshot uh, from the series. Here it is right here. And there is another uh, picture with him in the red and Amanda dressed like Orphan Annie, it looks like. And she was standing bes beside him. And they said that he would have her stand behind him and massage his neck. Okay, I'm sorry. What's a kid doing massaging a grown man's neck? How is that ever appropriate? So that's just one of the instances, like I said. And then also, I told you he did some things that were racially charged. Okay, so, and, and quite frankly, inappropriate. Now, here's one of the things he did. Look at, look at his nose and look at the things on his shoulder. Now, that's supposed to be a nose, nose is on his shoulder, but what does it look like? Okay, it clearly looks like cucumber. Okay, cucumber and, and uh, biscuits. Okay, please pay attention. And this was all by design. And then him putting that white nose on an African-American child also. Okay. And the actor who played that role is Leon Erickson. Okay, that's him as an adult. And then there was Giovanni Samuels. And uh, what's the other young man's name? Giovanni Samuels. I can't think of the other young man's name right now. Oh, I'm sorry. His name is Brian Hearn. Okay, Brian Hearn. That's him there in the plaid and green with Nick Cannon and another act, uh, child actor. And then this is him as an adult. And that's him in the orange. Now, what he talked about was basically, I believe it was him that had to uh, put on this this suit that was skin tone, okay? And then they put peanut butter all over him and had him lie on the floor and uh, dogs came and licked the peanut butter off. I'm sorry, how was that supposed to be funny? And, and then when they said that the outfit that he put on, which was like a bodysuit, they said that it had to be like skin tone. And then someone in the, on the crew, one of the crew members suggested that it should be charcoal. That's the color they said it should be, charcoal, okay? 
And so he was very offended by that. Absolutely disgusting, some of the things they did. And also take a look at this. So they had these segments where they would have uh, honey or something thrown in the faces of some of the cast members. You see that? That's honey on their face. I believe they said they used honey and sugar or honey or something like that. Uh, but I'm sure we can all see what it looks like. Okay. Clearly inappropriate. Why is that funny? So these are just some of the things that went on. And at the end of the day, he tried to defend his relationship with Amanda Bynes, but uh, you can't defend that. I'm sorry. There's no way to defend that. Okay. And then so... Um, Brian Hearn and Giovanni Samuels also spoke during the documentary. Let me put Giovanni Samuels' picture on the screen so you all know who she is. This is her right here. And that her in the orange with the orange blouse, that's when she was a kid on the show. And this is her now, as I'm sure you can see. But so anyway, her and uh, Brian Hearn spoke, as, as did Leon Erickson. And here's some of what they had to say. Likes up, everyone, please like and share. Former All That Child star Brian Hearn uh, alleges he was called a piece of charcoal while working at Nickelodeon. Remarks like that are harmful. They stay with you. Uh, this is what he said. Now, in this week's issue of People, Hearn, who is one of the many former Nickelodeon child stars featured in the upcoming docuseries, cringes at the memory of being cast in racially stereotyped roles as a rapper and a teen who sold cookies. Okay, pay attention. Sold cookies in an apparent reference to drug dealing. Uh, and he's still haunted by this. And he worked for Nickelodeon in the early 2000s. So I want you to pay attention to how they picked the African-American child uh, to be out there selling these cookies, okay, that were supposed to be a reference to crack, okay? Please pay attention. Now, goes on to say, I was referred to as a, uh, referred to as a piece of charcoal by an adult. Remarks like that are harmful. All in referring to the all that sketch where he played a rapper named Lil Fetus, okay? Hearn, now 35, says, I was already in an uncomfortable position being in a leotard. OK, that's not something that I'm used to at all. So this is a male child who was forced to wear a leotard. And he said that he was, you know, embarrassed and he felt uncomfortable because, you know, uh, things were showing. OK, in a leotard. And so Hearn was a cast member on the all on all that for season seven and eight, the former uh, of which premiered in 2002. The series was one of more than a dozen TV shows created in the 1990s through the 2010s uh, by Dan Schneider. It first aired on Nickelodeon in 1994. You know, and like I said, some of these parents didn't want to say anything because they didn't want their children to lose their jobs. Because Dan Schneider made it blatantly known on the set that he didn't like people disagreeing with him. He didn't like being told no. That's what one of the writers said. Okay, she sued him because she said that you know, he would have them working for days on end. They wouldn't be able to take breaks, go to the bathroom. He'd say, can you hold it? Just keep working. They had no time for themselves and were paid very poorly uh, because she, in fact, said that uh, at one point he wanted her to work free for 11 weeks. OK, for 11 weeks. And then uh, information about them splitting the salary because it was her and another female writer who had to split salaries. And then so SAG uh, came out, I guess, contacted them and basically said, you know, that it's illegal for cast members to have to or for uh, staff and crew to have to split a salary. And so Dan Schneider was livid. And he told her, he said, you know, if I find out that you told that, if you're the one, if you're the one that said that, you'll never work again. And so basically making threats. And uh, one woman ended up, the other female writer ended up getting fired because she took two weekends to herself. Now, this wasn't her taking time off, calling in or anything like that. It was just her taking her own personal time to do what she wanted to do two weekends. And for that, she was fired when she already was being paid so far. And then there was a, a male writer who was a Caucasian male who they hired. He had no credentials, you know, as far as writing uh, credits or anything like that. And they started him off with top notch salary. But meanwhile, Dan Schneider wanted these women to work for free and for very little when they were getting paid. 
Okay. And he even told them, I don't think women writers are funny at all. That's what he said. So he was a male chauvinist to boot. Hearn also credits his longtime friendship with all that alum, Giovanni Samuels, with helping him cope during that time. He said, that was a highlight of my work day to know that she would be there. Uh, Samuel shared the same sentiment. Now, this is Giovanni Samuels. Uh, she shared the same sentiment recently telling people, I didn't realize the significance of the impact that I, that I made on people being the only representation they had on television and going through, I hate to call it a trauma bond, but at least having somebody with me that I could talk to, not just as a child actor, but also culturally. Now, Samuels landed a role on the All That Show in 2002 and says it and says in this week's issue of People that it felt like a dream come true for the then 16-year-old. But she says her experience on set, uh, such as being the sole Black actress, not given a hairstylist or being trained to avoid choking during a sketch that required drinking enormous amounts of fake coffee sugar and felt like waterboarding. Said it felt like waterboarding, okay, often proved traumatizing. She said, you learn to walk that fine line. Uh, Samuels, who's now 38, she refers to herself and her as being the two token black kids. Samuels said that she also didn't have much of a relationship with Schneider. Dan Schneider was the guy that could, if he liked to, you would get a spinoff. You would get another show, she said. I understand that reference, and I, and I guess I shied away from it. Or I understood that reference. So in a statement to people regarding alleged behaviors on past production sets, Nickelodeon says, though we cannot corroborate or negate allegations of behaviors from productions decades ago, look, listen to them now, decades ago, trying to act like it's so long ago and they just had no clue. Of course they knew these things were going on. They may not have known every little detail, but they surely knew that inappropriate things were going on because, hey, who was signing off on this? Who was letting these things fly by? No one watched the recordings before they were aired. No one did any fact checking or, you know, uh, no one did any uh, review of these things. I absolutely think they did, please. But anyway, they're going to say, though we cannot corroborate or negate allegations of behaviors from productions decades ago, Nickelodeon, as a matter of policy, investigates all formal complaints as part of our commitment to fostering a safe and professional workplace environment free of harassment or other kinds of inappropriate conduct. Our highest priorities are the well-being and best interest, not just of our employees, cast, and crew, but of all children. And we have adopted numerous safeguards over the years to help ensure we're living up to our high, living up to our own high standards and the expectations of our audience. Now, one of the most shocking revelations in the docu-series is the presence of asexual predators on set. And 2004, production assistant Jason Handy, age 30, was sentenced to six years. And we already know the rest, okay? I just find it all egregious. But here's the thing. Here is the thing. Now, I'm going to show you all some footage where one of the former cast members uh, protested outside of the studios back in 2022. And why wasn't this all over the news? Well, I'm sure we can imagine why. Okay? So here's what it says. And I'm going to try to uh, replace some of these words. So pay attention. On August 25th of 2022, Nickelodeon Zoe 101 actress Alexa Nicholas stood in front of the Nickelodeon headquarters in Burbank, California to expose Nickelodeon on claims of P. Philia. In this video, she... Uh, she says Dan Schneider, who is also, she says Dan Schneider is also the man who was behind all of the foot fetish content on Nickelodeon. That's another thing because they had lots of scenes where the children had their bare feet out up in the air, just all sorts of things, someone rubbing their feet. It was all just crazy. But she said Dan Schneider was behind this uh, on Nickelodeon in the 1990s and early 2000s, along with SE actual abuse allegation uh, connected to a multitude of young stars. Britney Spears' sister, Jamie Lynn Spears, was the star of the show, and she left due to pregnancy, but also has allegations of abuse in connection with Dan Schneider. In addition to Schneider, Nicholas named Easel Channel, the production assistant for Adam Sh Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights, who was convicted of um, doing certain things, okay, at Nickelodeon. Brian Peck, 
uh, the dialogue coach for all that in comedy boot camp, who was convicted of doing the same thing uh, to a child on set. Marty Weiss, Nickelodeon's child talent manager, who was convicted of great on set. And, and this is just all, all real crazy. Okay, I want you all to pay attention. But here's the thing that I thought was uh, equally as interesting. So TMZ and the media reported on their one minute interview with Alexa Nicholas, but they never showed the footage that I'm about to show you. Please pay attention. They didn't show you this footage that you're about to see. And remember, you saw it here first. Now, they also claimed that she was there to protest a hostile work environment. Yet another example, this is just another example of how control how they control the narrative. Okay. And that's exactly what they did. Alexa continued to expose eight more people at Nickelodeon. And as of today, this is still the longest and most detailed allegation against Nickelodeon. So now I'm going to show you the video that TMZ wouldn't. And uh, I have edited it, uh, edited out certain phrases and words. Now, this is when she was in front of the studios in 2022. It's like three parts, so please bear with me. Nickelodeon. Oh God, this is the scary part for me. Okay, so we got here Dan Schneider, and to me, he is the creator of childhood trauma. Uh, he is a huge, uh, he played a huge role in my personal childhood trauma. I did not feel safe around Dan Schneider while I was working at Nickelodeon. Actually, every time he came on set, my body got extremely tense. Um, and later on in season two, he yelled at me, made me cry in a room actually at Nickelodeon. I'm not sure if it was at Burbank or Nick on Sunset. I think it was Nick on Sunset. Um, but him and a bunch of the executives made me cry in a room alone. And I don't think any child uh, should have to experience anything like that, especially if it's coming from people that are supposed to be looking out for the kids on set. Uh, that's deeply concerning to me. So here's an intro to another slime of Dan Schneider. Slime! Woo! I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. Okay, so we got next, Investigate Schneider's Bakery. Um, a lot of the footage on uh, Schneider's Bakery TV shows are concerning to me as a parent. So I would like Nickelodeon or someone actually external to Nickelodeon, not Nickelodeon, to investigate Schneider's Bakery. Um, there was footage on Zoe 101, Zoe 101 alone that when I look back at it now, I'm deeply uncomfortable by it. Uh, even if you say you didn't know or you were just being like, you know, childlike or whatever, I don't believe that because an adult should know how that could be seen. Uh, to others and it puts kids in a vulnerable position and it's very, very alarming and concerning. So I would like someone to investigate Schneider's Bakery and see what actually was going on in there and how many NDAs from Schneider's Bakery. Schneider's Bakery lawyer actually called me in 2019 asking me to come into a room with Dan Schneider to come up with some type of agreement. Uh, and so I'm guessing that was probably an NDA. I'm not fully sure, but it sounded like it. So Schneider's Bakery tried to silence me. So I would like them to investigate them. All right, slime time, uh, trigger warning. So we have one, two, three, four, five, four predators who worked at Nickelodeon around children. One of them here was a production assistant for Adam Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights. He worked at Nickelodeon. He was convicted, trigger warning, of a child at Nickelodeon. He was in the animation section, but he actually brought over a child to a studio where he um, sadly a child there at Nickelodeon, which is red flag Nickelodeon. Brian Peck, dialogue coach for all that. Um, he did the comedy boot camp with Dan Schneider. So this is a this was or is a friend of Dan Schneider. Predator convicted child on set. Slime, slime. Marty Weiss, child uh, talent manager who would bring kids to Nickelodeon. Predator convicted. Of okay, so all so crazy. But before I go to the next part, here's the thing. Also, I forgot to tell you guys, Brian Peck. Okay, the one who was the production uh, or the dialogue coach, he actually had some some type of gathering at his home and some of the cast and crew came there. 
And one of the cast members who was 14 years old at the time says that he showed him a self-portrait of John Wayne Gacy, okay, the serial killer. For those of you who've been following me from day one, you know I've done a story about him before on my True Crime channel. But nonetheless, he showed him a picture of John Wayne Gacy, this man who was convicted of murdering all of these young men. OK, and he said that he was uh, pen pals with him when he had been in prison, when John Wayne Gacy was in prison before his execution. He also had a myriad of letters in a nightstand next to his bed that he kept from their correspondences. And he proceeded to not only show this and brag about it to the 14 year old, but he showed it to other people that were there as well, because the 14 year old wouldn't told people that he showed him this. And so he was proud of that, being friends with the whole serial killer. OK who specifically was taking the lives of young men. Okay, I find it also interesting. And in fact, what led to John Wayne Gacy being caught, uh, made the police heavy on his trails, was the disappearance of a 15-year-old by the name of John Peast, I believe was his name. 15 years old, worked at a, a, a pharmacy. So I just find it all very interesting. This is who he was friends with, okay? And had a self-portrait and kept all those letters for all those years. And then bragged about it like it was just common. Now let's move on to part two. Who would bring kids to Nickelodeon. Predator, convicted of client. Jason Handy, production assistant for The Amanda Show, convicted predator. We have John here from The Ren and Stimpy Show. He was accused of abusing teenagers who uh, looked up to him as a mentor, so slime him as well. Slime time! Woo! How many predators, Nickelodeon? Because this is enough for me personally right now. All right, so we have Sharon uh, Liebline. Um, she was the vice president of talent. I have her here as enabler because she was in the room the day that I got verbally abused by Dan Schneider over there she said to me why are you crying and was basically making fun of me at 12 or 13 years old telling me that it was not called nicole 101 it was called zoe 101 and told me that i should just be sucking it up basically she also told me that she's the reason i got the show that i wouldn't have gotten the show if it wasn't for her so that was a little bit traumatizing in general to hear an adult saying something like that to you. So I have her here as an enabler because she worked close to Dan Schneider and nobody did anything about the abuse that was happening on the set of Zoe 101. Over here, we have a CEO of Nickelodeon. I have a question here for her. Is she the chief of enablers? Um, because if she's the CEO, how come she didn't step in at any time to protect any of these children? I think that is deeply concerning, again, because she is an adult running Nickelodeon and there were kids that said they were being abused on these sets. So where was she? Where was she? Slime time! <laughs> Cheryl Levine was a casting director. I have her here as enabler because everybody that was around me that was an adult at that time never intervened to protect me, never was concerned about me in general. So um, we're sliming Cheryl Levine today. Slime time! Here is a uh, CEO of Nickelodeon while I was there at Nickelodeon. My question to him is, do you have a noggin? Um, <laughs> because where were you when all of that was happening on set? How come you didn't step down to make sure that the kids there were well protected? I want to know where was he and do you have a noggin? Slime time! <laughs> all right, Fred Savage, we meet again. Um, Fred Savage was a director on Zoe 101 and he is now an alleged predator. And so this is something I want to talk about today is that as you can see, Predators are on these sets, <laughs> um, even around children. Maybe he wasn't alleged yet um, at the time, but there were predators around children at Nickelodeon. So what does that mean? Probably that's why they're having a bunch of people sign NDAs and silencing them. So I wanna know why so many predators were allowed on the set of Nickelodeon, just because there's children on set and we need to protect the children. We need to make sure we're not protecting the predator. What are his allegations? Um, I think it was on set, right? For Wonder Years. Um, he was uh, using or sexual allegations for the girls on set, right? Yeah. Oh, wait, sorry. Slime time, Fred Savage! Slime time. And then, Ian, we uh, 
we meet again um, here. He was the talent coordinator on Zoe 101. I have a question, child endangerment question mark, because he was the one who told my mom at 12 years old uh, that he was taking me to makeup and hair. And I stepped out without my mom. She stayed in the trailer and he was saying he was going to take me to makeup and hair. And then halfway there, he nervously said to me, oh, Brittany and Jamie want to talk to you in the trailer. And I remember being like, oh, maybe that's a good thing. Finally, someone's intervening. Maybe this is going to be a good mediation. And so I started stepping towards the trailer. And by the time I opened the door, I remember turning around to see if Ian was there and he disappeared. Um, and a lot of my trauma happened in that uh, trailer, to be honest with you. And let's just make a hypothetical here, though. Let's say it wasn't Brittany and Jamie in that trailer. What if he was taking me into a room with one of these predators over here? that were on Nickelodeon sets. And this is why it's so important to make sure that when you're working with children, like Nickelodeon, you have to make sure that you're protecting children, that there's proper education on set to make sure people like Ian don't bring a child into a place where their parent does not know where they are. My mom did not know where I was that day. She did not know she was lied to. And because of that, a lot of trauma was brought upon me in that experience. So we got to protect children. Ian did not protect, Ian did not protect me that day. So sliming Ian. Slime time! <laughs> All right, Matt, I don't know. He's a staff writer on Zoe 101. My question is Seth Lord, question mark, because uh, this, I, I don't know how to talk about this fully yet, but I was on uh, Family Guy and uh, it's a bad story that I don't really necessarily want to talk about today. But he told me that one of the staff writers on Zoe 101 became one of the staff writers on Family Guy and that he showed Seth Zoe 101 and said that she's 18 now. And that's what I heard. And so um, I'm not sure if this is him. So that's why it's a question. Um, but he can let me know. Um, but either way, if it is him, I feel like sliming him. So slime time! Here's hashtag eat predators, hashtag Nickelodeon too. And so I just want to go through this like one more time. Like what we're seeing here is a bunch of professional execs at Nickelodeon who did not protect the children on set. That's what I'm trying to show here today, that children on Nickelodeon were not safe, at least the time when I was on. Okay, so one last part. Okay, one last part. Hold on, here we go. It's like a minute and a half. I'm not sure if they changed anything, but what's deeply concerning to me is that Nickelodeon still has not given a comment to, for example, Jeanette McCurdy. Um, even to me, I've come forward multiple times. They've never given me an apology. And it's like, why not? Do we not deserve an apology whatsoever? Aren't you guys supposed to be the adults? Um, and we were the children. And if we were traumatized on your sets, we deserve an apology. And so I'm here at Nickelodeon waiting for an apology. And also I want to let everybody know that some of their presumptions about Nickelodeon in general were true. You know, there are predators at Nickelodeon. There are just predatory behavior in general. There are enablers on set. There are people looking the other way. And this is concerning when it comes to kid shows. We're talking about kid shows and we were not safe. We were not safe. So yeah, so that I guess that's today at Slime Time Live. Rally, Come over here. Let's go rally over here. Where's the megaphone? Does someone have it? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, I forgot the last slime of the day. Zoe 101! Slime Zoe 101! Okay. I could have done without all the yelling, but I get their point. Okay, so with that all being said, absolutely crazy. But here's the thing. Josh Peck, who also worked with Nickelodeon. Now, he's no relation to Brian Peck, but he was called out after he made some very strange or very strange comments, crazy behavior, so to speak. Uh, he was called out. And uh, then Drake Bell came out and spoke on his behalf. Okay, says fans are blasting Josh Peck for his silence showing the uh, following the bombshell abuse allegations that his former co-star Drake Bell and other Nickelodeon alums made in The Quiet on Set, uh, the Dark Side of Kids TV docuseries. 
TikTok users called out Peck after he posted a peculiar video Monday of himself lip syncing to a viral sound that says in part, if you haven't talked, if I haven't talked to you since 2023, take that as a effing sign that you don't exist to me anymore. Your silence speaks volumes, bro. This is what someone said. It's really sad. This is what a, a, a fan commented. They said it's too quiet on the set for us. Speak up. Uh, so I'm going to show the video clip where he clearly was looking real crazy. I don't know what that was all about. I don't know what that was all about. Please pay attention. If I haven't talked to you since 2023, take that as a fucking sign that you don't exist to me anymore. <laughs> Bug, you got sprayed with the raid. Bye. See you in that bar. If I haven't talked to you. I don't know what that was all about. Like I said, clearly sounds crazy. But um, so on his TikTok, Josh Bell, I'm, I'm sorry, Drake Bell uh, spoke on it because he said that he's getting a lot of, you know, nasty comments. Uh, Josh Peck is getting a lot of nasty comments. So I'm going to go to that clip really quick. Likes up, everyone. Please like and share. Thank you in advance. I've noticed comments on on some of Josh's TikToks. And I just want to let you guys know that, um, you know, processing this and going through this is a really emotional time. And a lot of it's very, very difficult, but he has reached out to, uh, to talk with me and, and help me work through this and uh, has been really, really great. Okay. So he says he's reached out to him and all of that, but why the strange behavior? I find it interesting. Um, at the end of the day, I'm going to do a part two to this because I haven't seen the last two parts. I do believe there's two more parts. And uh, also, I'm going to revisit some of the stuff that I spoke on about Disney. Because I, you know, find it interesting that they hired Brian Peck after he was convicted and then tried to use the old excuse. Well, we didn't know all about the charges. We didn't know exactly what happened. And he said that it had been taken care of. So you didn't look into it when you heard this man was a whole predator. I find it all very interesting. Okay. I find it all very interesting. And so with that all being said, everyone, please get the likes up. Please like and share uh, if you haven't done so already. Thank you in advance. And make sure you're, you double check to ensure that you're still subscribed to the channel. People get unsubscribed mysteriously on, da on a daily basis. So make sure you're still subscribed, especially if you have not been receiving those notifications. Now, with that all being said, um, I'm going live on the backup channel. Moderators, please, if you haven't done so, please put the link in the chat for the backup channel where I'm about to go live following this. Okay. Amelia said, yeah, so they need to leave Josh alone. Um, Charlie Sheen and his cohorts need to be in jail too. Oh, yeah, they absolutely do. They absolutely do as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Uh, hold on. I'm trying to read a few of these comments. All these industries are nefarious. Shut down this, shut this whole ish down. Okay, exactly. So with that all being said, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Please like and share. Uh, with that all being said, I hope to see you all the next chats and on the spiritual channel later at 1.30. Okay, and so until next time, beloveds, each one teach one. That's how we grow and thrive. Do something productive, constructive, but never destructive. And always remember to keep the most high first in your lives. Peace.